Yeah, before we uh, jump into our text, um, just a reminder that we are going to be having uh, communion today. So if you have communion set up at your house, um, I got a picture just moments ago, uh, about 30 minutes ago, from Dean and Juanita Cook. So Dean and Juanita, good job setting up communion. They're ready to roll. And uh, just everyone who's joining us, it's really great that we can celebrate together. I want to start this morning by having you imagine something. And so let me tell you a story. It's not not a true story, but let me have you imagine this situation. And as you imagine this situation, I want to ask the question, what's the problem here? So listen to the story, and at the end of it, I'm going to say, what's the problem with the story that I'm about to tell you? Imagine that you were in this sanctuary, and it was full of people. And imagine that I was up here, I was about to give our mission statement, And I said, you know, at Monte Vista, we seek to be prayerful, compassionate, and humble disciples. And then somebody walked in the back. And I noticed who it was. And right in the middle of the mission statement, I stopped and I walked to the back of the church. And I said, welcome. It is so good for you to be here. I go, are you Bill Gates? And he says, yes, it is. I said, Mr. Gates, I am so glad you're here. You do such good work around the world. I just appreciate that. And by the way, Monta Vista has a lot of things you could support. But anyway, I'm so welcome that you're here. Why don't you come down to the very front row and sit with me? I would love for that to happen. He comes down, he sits down, and I look in the back and I said, Hey, John, can you get Mr. Gates a cup of coffee and a Danish? And then Mr. Gates goes, Wow, do you do this for every visitor? Oh, yes, Mr. Gates, we do this for everybody. Coffee and Danish is for everyone in the sanctuary. And he's pretty impressed. So I said, well, welcome. So I come back up and I say, well, again, let me start over. Welcome. At Monte Vista, we seek to be prayerful, compassionate. And then somebody else walks in. And I look in the back and this guy is dressed really shabbily. He actually has a bike, an old bike that he brings into the sanctuary. And it has these bags, these plastic, old plastic bags with his stuff. And I walk to the back and I say, so what are you doing here? He's like, I just came here to worship. I was, I was pedaling by. I said, oh, um, okay. I mean, that's cool. But, uh, you know, what? Um, Dude, you kind of stink. I don't want to be offensive or anything. So if you could just stay in the back, that would be great. Well, actually, no, don't sit in the chairs. They're new. Why don't you just sit on the floor? And, dude, take the bike out. We don't bring bikes into the sanctuary. I mean, you can stay. But just stay in the back. Okay. What's the problem with that situation. To welcome Mr. Gates with everything and then to welcome to the no-name man on a bike to sit at the floor of their feet. What's wrong with that? Like everything. Like, I mean, like, like everything, you know, and can you imagine if I told that to the guy and I walked up here and said, and we seek to be prayerful, compassionate, and humble disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I could just imagine that guy going, dude, are you kidding me? You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Can you imagine that? What else, what else is wrong with that? Well, there's something wrong about honoring the rich and the powerful and literally putting down the marginalized, the unknown. And it's wrong because it goes against the very nature of who God is. It's not just wrong from a human perspective. It's wrong from from the very sense of who God is. I want to share with you this verse from Deuteronomy. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 10. Um, God is speaking to the people of Israel. They're about to go into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, it says this. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, doesn't have favorites, and accepts no brides. 
scribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you, who, and you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. In the very nature of God is a heart to reach out to those who are on the outside. Like in God's very nature, he reaches out to the fatherless, to the orphan. He reaches out to the widow and the one who is not in the community. And what he says to his people is that remember that you were once not in the community. You were once slaves in Egypt. You were once on the outside. And you are to love and to welcome them in. To show partiality or favoritism goes against the very character and the nature of God. And we see that as like the story of salvation continues. Because God starts off with, well actually he starts off with Abraham and he chooses him. Then God chooses a nation of Israel. And then God says, I'm going to give it to the whole world. That's what happened with Christ. Like when Jesus died on a cross and was risen from the grave, this was God saying, I'm opening the doors to everyone. This is good news for all people of all time. And he opens the doors and in Christ, everything changes. Check this out. In the book of Galatians, Paul describes what changes because of the cross of Christ. This is Galatians chapter three. It says this, you are all children of God through our faith, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all, of you were, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to the promise. Do you see what Christ did? He removed distinctions. Like you're no longer a Jew or a Greek. Like the, that cultural difference is, he's like, no, that's, not, that's not there anymore. In Christ, like when you've been baptized into Christ, there's no longer slave nor free. There's no longer even male or female. He says, because in Christ we've been clothed, literally put on outer garments, clothed in Christ, and we are all one. And so to show favoritism to someone in the front row and as opposed to someone in the back is to actually move against one of the works that was done on the cross. Like literally, God brought us all in when we are baptized into Christ. So like the essence of the Christian church is to not give preference over one or the other because of cultural differences or financial differences or even gender differences. Now, we have differences. There's no question. We live in a world of differences. God's not saying ignore the differences, but he is saying in Christ, we're all together in this. There are no favorites. And that's where our text in the book of James is going to take us. In fact, he's going to hit what I've just said really hard. So for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, we are in the study of the book of James. And the book of James is this fabulous New Testament book that is filled with nuggets of wisdom. It's like these really kind of gold nuggets of wisdom that he just kind of highlights over and over again. And he, he is a, it's hardcore. Like he just hits you. Like he's like, this is what you need to do. This is how you live in Christ. He's speaking to a Christian church and he's calling them to live faithfully to Christ. In fact, um, of the 108 verses in the book of James, about 54, 56 of them are commands. This is how you are to live. And that's what we're going to see today. So this is James chapter 2. And the first gold nugget that we're going to see is that if God does not show favoritism then neither should we. If it's in the very nature of God to invite, to not show favoritism, neither should we. So James chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, check this out. He says, my brothers, so he's writing to the church, like my brothers and sisters, the, the community. My brothers, 
as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, command, don't show favoritism. And, and now notice how he, he sets it up. He goes, he goes, you're not just people, because if you are believers in the, the glory, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, you will not, you should not show favoritism. In other words, to lift someone else up over another. Um, and then he gives this illustration, which you've already heard. He says this, Suppose a person comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he, he lays it out like super clearly. He goes, if someone comes in, like we talked about, it just seems wrong that you would highlight the rich and the powerful over the lost and the marginalized. And James says, it is wrong. In fact, he's actually quoting a verse from Leviticus where he says you are um, committing evil thoughts or perverting the justice of God in which he would welcome in those who are on the outside. One of the stories that stands out to me with what's wrong with having favorites or marginalizing or keeping people out is one of the places in Mahatma Gandhi's life. So in Gandhi's life, he uh, was put out of the church with devastating effects. There was a, a missionary who was in India. His name was E. Stanley Jones. And he asked Gandhi about that. In fact, let me read to this. So E. Stanley was with Gandhi, and he said to him, Mr. Gandhi, though you quote the words of Christ often, why is it that you appear to be so ad why is it that you appear to so adamantly reject becoming his follower? So Gandhi was known to quote the words of Christ. And so this missionary, Stan E. Stanley Jones, says, Why don't you follow him? And then Gandhi replied, Oh, I don't reject your Christ. I love your Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike your Christ. And Gandhi just likes it. Man, Jesus, yeah, I like him. I like the way he teaches. And apparently this goes back into an experience that Gandhi had when he was a, uh, studying to be a lawyer in South Africa. At the time that he was studying to be a lawyer, he was also studying the words of Christ, and there was a, there was a compelling in him, a, a compulsion in him to move towards who is Jesus and what does he stand for. And so then he went to a church in South Africa, and let me read to you what happened. And so he decided to attend a church service. And as he came up the steps of a large church where he intended to go, a white South African elder of the church barred his way at the door. Where do you think you are going? And he calls in this really negative word for people like Gandhi. He goes, where do you think you're going? And he, negative word. The man asked Gandhi in a belligerent tone of voice. And Gandhi replied, I like to attend worship here. And the church elder snarled at him. There's no room for people like you in this church. Get out of here. I'll have my assistants throw you down the steps. And then the commentator writes, From that moment, Gandhi said he decided to adopt what, was good he, what good he found in Christianity, but he would never again consider becoming a Christian if it meant being part of the church. When we practice favoritism or partiality, when we don't seek out and welcome the the person on the outside, the marginalized into the church, when we have these pre predispositions towards keeping people out, we are literally going against the heart of God. Because the heart of God is to welcome people in. And in the Christian church, when we're baptized into Christ, those, some of those uh, distinctions, they don't become the primary factors of how we relate to one another because we are one in Christ. That's the first golden nugget of James. The first golden nugget is this. 
Because God does not show favoritism, those who love God should also not show favoritism. Check out this next golden nugget. In Christ, to be poor is to be rich. I mean, think about that for a minute. In Christ, to be poor is to be rich. This is how James describes that. Just following right along at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, my beloved brothers. Listen, my beloved. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? I'm going to read that again. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Man, this is a golden nugget of Christianity. That for those who are poor in the eyes of the world, God has chosen, invited in to be rich, to be wealthy, like extravagantly wealthy in faith, and to inherit the kingdom for those who love him. You'll remember that James was the half-brother of Jesus. So James saw Jesus teach. James was aware of Jesus' teaching. And one of, the, one of the teachings that Jesus has in the book of Matthew, we call the Sermon on the Mount. And we see a lot of the Sermon on the Mount actually in the book of James. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Don't you know that those whom God has chosen to be poor can be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom that God has for those who love him? He's basically quoting Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus was also teaching at another time where he said the same type of thing in Luke chapter 6 where he said this. You are blessed when you are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Like, he wasn't just saying poor in spirit. In this situation, Jesus was teaching, you are blessed when you are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. This is a golden nugget of Christianity. Like, there's a reversal. Like, God says, when you are super bummed, when you are super poor in spirit, when you are, like, at the end of your rope, that makes you ready to receive the kingdom. And and Jesus literally says, when you don't have everything you need, when you're feeling the the downside of life, you're ready to receive or inherit the kingdom. Which is, man, it's it's a golden nugget when you grab hold of it, and yet it's, it's so hard at times to grab hold of that. Just a very small example. This week, um, like on Wednesday, it was just a rough day for me. I was having a rough day. And it was a rough day because I was overwhelmed by all the things that have been happening in the last four, five, six, eight, ten weeks. And I just, I reached a downside. I was probably in the uh, sadness part of grief in this whole coronavirus thing. And, and it was really hard. It was just one of those days where I was like, dude, this is hard. It was just a bad day and, and I'm feeling it. And, and, I, and I know these verses. Like I know when you're poor in spirit, you're close to the kingdom. But I'll tell you what, this is, you, you know this experience, this is my experience. I was not feeling blessed. Like if somebody would have given me this verse on Wednesday about 2 o'clock, I would have said, dude, shh. And then I said, I know these verses. I know there's a promise there. And so that's when I said, okay, so what did he mean when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God? And I started dwelling a little bit on the truth that when I am fully empty, I am able to receive what God has because nothing's getting in the way because I got nothing. And God can fill me. And I started praying about that. And then I also started talking to people because I know sometimes God calls us to be in community. So phone, Skype, whatever it was, I started talking to people about, man, this is a hard day for me. And they began to pray. And it was interesting because I was totally at this low spot. And then suddenly as I'm entering scripture, I'm praying, I'm I'm interacting with people, God started lifting me up. And I'm like, dude, this stuff like really works because it's true. And truth, man, when you experience truth, it tastes so good. 
And when James says, don't you know that God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith, poor in the eyes of the world, to be rich in faith, to inherit the kingdom for those that love him? James is just expressing this golden nugget of Christianity. And remember, James is expressing this not simply because he learned it from Jesus, but he lived it. Do you guys remember that James is the half-brother of Jesus? Do you know how James grew up? Poor. I mean, Mary and Joseph, you know, Jesus' parents, um, James's parents, Mary and Joseph didn't have a lot of money. In fact, you see in Scripture that even when they went to have Jesus taken to the temple, they had to give a sacrifice for the poor people because they didn't have a lot. And do you remember, like, when uh, God called Mary to carry Jesus... Um, she's shocked on one level because she is lowly and humble. She actually sings a song about it. She's like, I was a lowly handmaid, and you lifted me up. And, and she experienced that. And I can only imagine being James, growing up with Mary and Joseph as their parents, living poor, but seeing how rich they were in faith because they lived God's faithfulness. And James says, man, don't you know that when you're poor by world standards that God can make you rich? And it just got me thinking this week how important it is for parents, for us, for grandparents to live in faith in hard times because our kids and our grandkids gets to see, will see the truth of Scripture. That sometimes when we are poor, we are rich. James moves on and he talks about um, how people sometimes will focus on the rich and the powerful, which is kind of crazy because the rich and the powerful are sometimes the ones who are oppressing the poor. He says this, But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? And so like this, this scenario he's talking about in the early church is like, why are you choosing to honor the rich when they're the ones who are actually tearing down the name of the Christian church? They're the ones who are tearing it down. And he, he throws that in, in there and he says, come on, guys, we got to get perspective here. There's a golden nugget in Christianity. When you're poor, you can be rich. There's another golden nugget. So he moves on, and uh, the golden nugget is this. Knowing God's will is quite simple. Love your neighbor. It's not complicated. Like, if you want to know the will of God for your life, love your neighbor. This is how James says it as we continue on in our passage. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. So James, golden nugget, here it is. He goes, if you follow the royal law, he's referring to uh, the, the law that was given in the book of Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. It's what we call the golden rule, it's golden nuggets. We call it the golden rule because we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it makes it super clear. This is what God calls us to do. He's like, just as you have received mercy, he said to the Jews, so you become one who gives mercy. Just as you were once an alien, welcome in the alien. He kind of says it over and over again. Love your neighbor. It's that simple. In fact, uh, there's a rabbi, there was a rabbi in the first century, a super famous rabbi. His name was Hillel. And there was a whole school that formed around him. He was one of these wise sages um, around the beginning, before the first century, and into the first century. And there's a story where there was a man who came to him who wanted to learn God's will for his life. And so imagine like this young guy going to this older guy, going to the sage, and he goes, I just want to know God's will for my life. And this is how Hillel responded. What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah, while the rest is just commentary. Go and learn it. So this guy's looking for this big answer, and Hillel says this. What you hate being done to you, don't do it to someone else. Everything else is just commentary. It's really that simple. It's like the flip side of love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you hate something, don't do that to someone else. As an example, 
If you hate it when someone doesn't listen to you, when you're trying to explain something, what should you do? Be a listener. Right? Don't, don't do the same thing back to them because you hate it, so you know they're going to hate it. Like, be a good listener. And when you're a good listener, what are you doing? You're loving your neighbor as yourself. I mean, like, how about this? If you hate... Well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been on the outside of a community? Have you ever been the one that you weren't welcomed into the group? Have you ever been the one you showed up? I mean, I think of me when growing up in high school, going to the beach and having the locals not want me there. I think about people who've talked about going to church. They go to the church and nobody says hi to them. They don't feel welcomed. It's not that they're pushed out, they're just ignored out. Have you ever experienced that? Being on the outside? Don't you hate that? Okay, so according to Hillel, what do we not do? Keep people on the outside. We don't just hang out with our favorites. I just, I love this because James makes it super simple. If you want to keep the law, love your neighbor as yourself, then that would be perfect. But then he goes on to say, but if you don't do it, you sin. Like, and you become a lawbreaker. And then listen to what he says. He hits it hard right now. And we're, we're about to get hard, so if you're ready for hard, good. If you're not ready for hard, get ready, because you're going to realize, or Lee James is going to say to us, that all of us are sinful. All of us break the law, and it matters. Okay, so if, you, if you're paying favorites, you're sinning, and then he says this. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he... For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. All right, so let me break it down. So like, God's given us all these commands to follow in the Hebrew scriptures. And he says, if you break even one of them, it is like breaking all of them. Which is weird, right? That doesn't seem fair. You know, like that, that idea of, well, I don't know if you've ever said this, like someone says, you know, um, you're sinful. And you're like, dude, I'm not sinful. What are you talking about? I, mean, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not sinful. And they say, why would you say it? Well, I've never killed anybody. I mean, that's like sinful. You know, I've never done that. I've never, you fill in what you think is like the worst sin. And then someone says, well, have you ever lied in order to deceive someone to get what you want. Well, yeah, everybody lies. Well, yeah, there you go. And when you do that little sin, that's like breaking the, all of it. Well, that doesn't seem fair. I, and I felt, I mean, I was, I was thinking about this, and I was listening to a couple sermons on this passage, and this guy, I thought, gave this excellent illustration. He said, um, it's kind of like if you break a window. So right there you see on the screen, this is a window of a friend of mine who has a restaurant up in uh, San Francisco. Her name is Jeannie Kim. Some of you guys know Jeannie. Someone broke a window of one of her restaurants this week. They broke the little, see the little piece down there at the bottom. Now imagine if the person who broke the window went to Jeannie and said, hey, I'm the one who broke your window. I had a brick and I threw it in and I broke it. I want to pay for it. And Jeannie was like, that's awesome. And he goes, here's $10. And Jeannie's like, dude, it's not $10. I mean, it's going to cost a couple hundred bucks to replace the window. And he says, no, I just broke that little part. I'm paying for the little part I broke. What would you say? A little part is the whole window. <laughs> like, you can't just replace that. And I think that's where James is leading us in this text. Like, if we show favoritism, if we have these places of the law that we break, it's breaking the whole of it. And then what that does is it puts all of us in the same category. All of us are in a place of turning away from God in some aspect of our life. We, I think this is a fair statement. We don't always love our neighbor as we love ourselves. 
We actually sometimes, all of us, I would think, do things that we don't want done to us to other people. And because that is true, James gives us another nugget. And it talks about mercy and judgment. In fact, this nugget says, um, mercy always triumphs over judgment. Like always. But it's still there. Listen to what James says. He, I mean, he hits it extremely on point. He goes, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful mercy triumphs over judgment so james james says this grace mercy grace does not mean you don't have to follow god's commands in fact speak and act as those who are going to be judged for following God's commands. Like it matters whether we show favoritism. It matters if we don't love our neighbor as ourselves. We will be judged, but check it out, by the law that gives freedom, by one who's experienced mercy. So grace actually frees us to live into how God wants us to live. Some people see like God's commands as we have to live this in order to be loved. But in reality, what we see is God loves us. And because Jesus died on the cross while we were still yet sinners, Jesus loves us. So when we receive his love, then we can go out and love others. And mercy will always triumph over judgment. But don't be mistaken. Sin is still sin. If we shun the outsider, we'll be held accountable to that. And the one who holds us accountable is the one who gives us mercy. But it matters. It totally matters. So there's been a couple golden nuggets of wisdom that we've seen in this text this morning. You got the, that nugget of wisdom that um, since God is one who doesn't show favoritism, those who love God should also not show favoritism. That, that idea that in Christ there's no male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. But there's that other golden nugget. It's that nugget in which uh, God sees the poor as rich or God, the possibility of those who see themselves as poor in spirit can be rich as we inherit the kingdom. The other golden nugget is, man, God's will is quite simple. It's, it's pretty simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the other golden nugget is, and it matters if you love your neighbor as yourself. But know that mercy triumphs over those times when we don't. But don't be fooled. It matters how we live. And so, like, all of that, like, as, you, as I put it all together, it made me so thankful that we're having communion this morning. Because this is one of those texts where you can be like, man, okay, this is hard and good and, and I'm not quite sure how to feel. Like, like okay, because I'm not perfect. Like when I hear about judgment, I stand under judgment because I don't always love. I don't always get rid of my prejudices. And that's what's so crazy important about this table. Because it's at this table where we're all equal. You can be one of the richest men in the world and when you come to this table, if you're Bill Gates, you're just Bill. All the riches don't matter at all at this table. You can be one who is extremely poor and has nothing and you come to this table you're loved as if you're everything. Like that's what this table is. Because in Christ Jesus 
when we are baptized into Christ, God doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inside and he's calling people who want to follow him. That's why I love this table. Because this table just represents that which is true about the heart of God. He calls all of us. We're all sinful. And he wants to forgive all of that sin. And it just requires us to say yes. Yes.